Okay, hello and welcome everybody to Making Your Publications Count. This is a follow-on presentation from Fahin's session just before on publishing your research. And this is talking about how you then count your research. So I'm Crystal, I'm one of the librarians here at CDU Library. And joining me today is the fabulous Rachel. If you'd like to turn on your camera and give us a wave, Rach. Hi Crystal, hello everyone in the classroom and I'll be monitoring the chat today so if you do have any questions throughout the session you can always type in there and we'll always be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, thanks Crystal. No worries, thank you. So we're going to get started today and talking about everything to do with counting your publications and metrics so we're probably going to go pretty fast and through some content that is confusing so we would encourage you while we're going to put any ch questions you have in the chat you're also welcome to turn your microphones on and ask any questions you have um, using your own voice, um, but be mindful that the session is being recorded as well. So um, let's get started. So I'd like to acknowledge first that we're here on the lands of the Larrakia people in sunny Darwin and to pay my respects to um, Indigenous cultures and elders past, present and emerging. You might like to place in the chat where you're joining us from and acknowledge the Indigenous owners of the lands that you're on today as well. Okay, so what we're going to cover today, we're going to talk about metrics, like what are they? We're going to talk about different types of metrics, um, how you can use metrics responsibly to talk about your research and the impact of your research. We're then going to delve into a bit about alternative metrics or alt metrics, which if you just um, attended Fahin's session, you got a taster of there. We're going to hopefully demystify the H-index for you and then talk a bit about writing about your research. So to get us started today, um, tell us a bit about you. Um, please write in the chat and tell us where you're at on your research journey and what led you here today. So are you beginning your research? Are you not sure what metrics are and what they mean for you just yet? Or are you somewhere, um, are you a seasoned um, researcher who's written about your, your research and you know what some of these metrics are and you're just coming today for a refresher or are you somewhere in the middle? So it's okay wherever you're at we'll have something to um, share with you, we'll have some information for you and hopefully we'll be able to answer some of your questions. But hopefully by the end of the presentation, you'll have a clearer idea of what research metrics are, what they tell you about your research and how you can use them to promote yourself and your research. And you'll know where to go with questions where you have them. Okay. So we'll dive straight into what are metrics? So you've got three different types of metrics, if you like. Um, but before we even get into those, Bibliometrics um, comes from the biblio, meaning books, which is Greek, and metrics, which is a unit of measuring. So they're numerical measures of your impact as a researcher. We use units of measurements daily when you think of things like the time, height, length. So bibliometrics refer to your academic performance. And it's important to remember while we go through this whole presentation that they're only one measure of success. So the impact of your re research is measured by how many times a piece of your research is cited by a subject or author and how many times a specific article and journal is cited to then assess the importance of the journal and its impact in the field of study. They are also used to calculate university rankings. So to understand research metrics and their importance and how to interpret them, you need to consider what it is that you want to know in order to then know where to draw that information from. So this is what we mean when we've got three different types of metrics. You've got an author level metric, an article level metric, or a journal level metric. So you can see there that I've used the very famous Albert Einstein as my example here. So to, just, to demonstrate the kind of author level metrics that can be found on a Google Scholar profile. So this is showing how many times Albert has been cited and which years 
that that paper was written in. And then we're looking at things like his H index of 103. And um, all of those information, all of that information has come from Google Scholar. Then if we go across to the article level metrics, we've got um, details there that can be drawn from the article and what that means in relation to the journal that it's published in. And then journal level metrics. So then you're looking at the different, the numbers, if you like, or the metrics for the particular journal. So you can use each for different things. So things like author level metrics, uh, the H index, Google Scholar, the FWCI or field weighted citation impact, which is a CIVAL metric, the category normalized citation impact or CNCI, which is drawn from insights, the citations per publication, which is drawn from CIVAL on insights, and the author level eigenfactor, which is an SSRN found in Elsevier. Author level metrics describe the researcher and can be used to distinguish researchers from another most effectively in the same fields of research. The journal level rate, um, metrics include things like JCR, the journal citation reports, the JIF, a GIF, the journal impact factor, the SJR, the Simago journal rank, eigenfactor, SNP and site score, which is Scopus, or H index for journal. And again, these are used to quantify and measure journals and compare journals within specific subjects. Article level metrics include alt metrics, plus article level metrics, and article citation counts. Okay, how are we going for questions? I'm just going to check. Thank you for um, your updates about where you're at. That's really great to hear and to see that we've got a wide range there. Okay, so why should you care about metrics? Well, first of all, they're a personal metric for you. So they tell you how you're going in your research journey. They help you keep records for your, of your research to track your performance over time and hopefully see improvements. And they help with your career development and progression and things like academic promotions if you're going to go on and have an academic career. From an institutional point of view, they're good for CDU to keep track of as well. They help prove our standing in the Excellence for Research of Australia process, which is a um, process that happens every three years and the university, three or four years, the university is going through a cycle of that currently, needing to prove their research is valid and our st um, we are producing good, um, impactful research, which revo results in more funding for us in the institution, so more um, opportunities for our PhD students and researchers. It results in more grants and exciting opportunities for research and collaborations with other institutions who want to come and research with us because we have a good reputation. And it links in with the university's strategic plan as well. All of this, regardless of whether you're talking from a personal point of view or an institutional point of view, impro means improvements to the quality and impact of the research for both the person and the individual as well. So, Fahin also mentioned before the OASIC scheme. So I'd like to just mention that again, uh, when it comes to talking about um, impact of your research, Open access publishing means your research has more impact. It gets it out there to more people. And CDU have the Open Access Support for Increased Citation Schemes, or OASAC, SIC. And that's tied spe to specific metrics. That is, it's tied to journals that fall within a Q1 um, journal ranking as a cause to SJR, which is Simago Journal Ranking. So this means an increase in Q1 or equivalent publications, and it can increase the uptake and impact of research by end users as well. Any questions about that? No, we'll keep going. Okay, so I mentioned before about responsible use of metrics. So there are, important reasons why we would want to pay attention to and use our metrics responsibly. It is important to combine a variety of metrics with qualitative e evidence to, to 
demonstrate your research value. Metrics should be used critically and they can't replace the informed judgment of peers. Evidence can take many forms and will be highly dependent on the aims and outcomes of an individual research project. The Leiden Manifesto for Research Metrics outlines 10 principles to guide research evaluation and the San Francisco Declarations on Research Assessment or DORA similarly outlines a range of issues to keep in mind when using research metrics. I highly recommend you looking up those documents They can be found on Google and they will help to elucidate this process. So responsible use of metrics involves robustness, humility, transparency, diversity and reflexivity. The robustness means that metrics need to stand up to professional scrutiny and quality measures. They can be verified and relied upon. Humility means taking into account the qualitative nature and the quantitative nature of um, data. So qualitative nature, qualitative data can be counted, measured and expressed using num numbers. Qualitative data is descriptive and conceptual. Qualitative data can be categorised based on traits and characteristics. The numbers should support who you are as a researcher. It's not all about a number of your publications, rather the qualitative, the quality and the relativeness of that data to your research. Your, data, your metrics should be transparent. So that says keeping data collection and analytical processes open and transparent so that those being ev evaluated can test and verify the results. They should be responsive, accounting for, for a variety of research, researchers and research types. So they should be diverse. And reflexive, reflexive recognising and anticipating the syst systemic and potential effects of indicators and then updating them in response. Okay, so talking about journal in metrics in, in detail here. So it's easy to get lost in the acronyms, that is JIF, JCR and ERA, and those meaning um, Journal Impact Factor, Journal Citation Reports and Excellence in Research for Australia, as I mentioned before. Articles in the sciences tend to rank higher than those in the humanities. This is a known limitation. So Web of Science is not as strong in the arts area. There's no substitute there. There is a discrepancy between the arts and sciences. Science is citation and publication heavy, as is medicine and psychology. The more intangible subjects require and value performances. On the job performance, and this is a known limitation of these. So, journal citation reports, which is a web of science um, metric, data set has rankings. You will need to create your own login to use them, but there's no subscription needed. Um, so Margo Journal and Country Rank can be used to look at journal metrics. And thank you, Fahin, for showing that earlier. I can show you how you can find that a little bit later. Again, for those of, those of us who are new to this session. So what are Q1 journals? Well, Q1 journals are the journals that fall within the top 25% of journals in their field of research. So we'll jump out, see if I can share my screen with you and I can show you. So I'm just going to share my screen. I can show you finding a journal in JCR for those of us who are new. So we'll go to SCR. Okay, so you can find it in Google. If you open up Simago. Okay, and then you can do a search for journal title or publisher name. So if you had a particular journal that you were looking at, let's look up Nature. And you can select from the list. And then you can find the information here on the SJR website. So you can find if you're looking for a journal to publish in, if I can cover all of this before, you've got information here about how to publish. If we scroll down, 
You can see it's all green, which you'll see when we keep scrolling down, means that Nietzsche is a Q1 journal. And you can see other information here about the journal as well. And if you are considering publishing in a journal, you can find all of this on the SGR website. And here it's been Q1 since 1999 as well. So that's all very helpful information for you to know. Okay. So I'll stop sharing now. We'll go back to the presentation. Oh, Rach, I think I've lost the presentation. <laughs> oh, sorry, one minute, Crystal. Sorry. I'll no worries. Pop that, pop that back up. Don't Thank you so much. We actually shared anything just then. Oh, you couldn't see anything, no. Alex? No. Oh, could anyone else see anything? Uh, I could, Crystal. Okay. Oh, sorry, Alex. I'll make sure I check the next time I jump out. Okay, uh, maybe I will... I've, um, I've concentrated. I have your your you or your camera rather than the other screen oh it's up now so yeah. okay you should see the last screen we were on so yeah. i'll be mindful i will check before i go out and make sure that people can okay. um, see my screen again i believe there's only one other time i'll be sharing my screen okay yep fine right so I'm handing across to Rach anyway right now. Excellent. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, thanks, Crystal. Okay, so th and that's really useful too, the, but the distinction between different disciplines and the way we measure things. And two other areas that uh, do have some different ways of measuring a journal and uh, statistics are the areas of business and law. These journals are mainly assessed on peer review rather than citation analysis. And it's generally because citations in the law area are generally low, as they can be in the business area. So if we use traditional tools that we might use for science disciplines, when we compare them in the business and law area, they can be generally low. So an example of this is the Federal Law Review, one of the primary uh, law journals. Yeah, if we use it in something like SJI or one of the other sort of uh, journal metric databases, it has quite a, a low uh, a low appearance. So it's only got a H index of two, so quite low, and it's not a Q1 journal. Same with the Australian Journal of Management. This is one of the premier Lord uh, business journals. If we look at it again, quite low and not in the uh, not a Q1 journal. But because of this, there are some alternative lists that can be used in other disciplines. One example is the Australian Business Dean's Council list. If we use the Australian Business Dean's Council list, which is available, freely available online, we can see that the Federal Law Review is an A-star journal, which means it is one of the highest rankings. It's on the A2 and lower, lower A-star is the highest. We look at the Australian Journal of Management, it's an A list. And it's sort of important to know that there are other lists to look at because sometimes when you're applying for grants or promotions or other ways of describing, if you work in a discipline such as a law or business, there are some alternative lists you can use. A common one is Australian Business Deans. So they list their journals from A to C. The latest list is from 2019. So a bit older, but it has a great list of journals there. There's also the Washington and Lee School of Law list and the Sydney University Business School ranking list. Another way to evaluate how the journal is performing using alternative tools. Thanks, Crystal. No worries. Thanks so much, Rach. So moving right along. So rather than jumping into the databases and um, getting lost, I've taken some screenshots over the next couple of pages to show you the kind of information that you can find in Scopus that will help you to talk about your research. So these are from Scopus. This is an example that um, Fahim used before, um, showing that different, um, well, this is the same researcher rather. Okay, so we've got here an example of from Scopus and wondering sort of 
when you open this up, what can you see in this profile? So we can see at the very top under his name, we've got where the researcher is from. So um, the information in Scopus shows the affiliation of the researcher to CDU. Thanks, Rach. We've got his Scopus ID listed there, which again, this is the profile from Scopus, so you would expect to see that there. Next to that, however, we've got the prompt to connect to ORCID. So this means that the researcher's ORCID ID hasn't been added to his Scopus profile yet. So that's something you would want to do to make sure that you've connected your research and have it all in the one place. And then you've got the option there to connect to a Mendeley account as well, if you have one. So that's something else you can help to keep track of your research that's in that, that location to keep that all together. So Scopus and having a Scopus profile means you can keep all of your content and data from external websites and applications, including abstracts and citation data from scholarly journals, books and conferences that are indexed by Scopus. That's important. They need to be indexed by Scopus to have them in your Scopus account. So don't fall into the trap of thinking that you have one, one research um, profile such as Scopus and it will keep absolutely everything for you. That's not the case and you might have, be in a situation where you need to keep several. So the one research, um, if you like, the one research aggregator for them all would be your ORCID. That keeps every single part piece of your research together in, in one place. Okay, moving along. So now we've got an example from SciVal. So SciVal is part of Scopus. It uses Scopus data to keep your metrics together. So here you've got an example of the same researcher and the profile that you see in SciVal. So immediately you can see different numbers there and different kinds of information. So we can see that this researcher has 10 research outputs. They have a field weighted citation impact of 2.28. Now that's a very good FWCI. One is world standard. So that means that this researcher is doing better than twice world standard. There are, of those 10 outputs, there is 298 citations, meaning that they've got 2 point or 29 research, um, or 29 citations averaged per paper. And there you can see that down the bottom, the 29.8 citations per publication, a H index of 10 as well. And I'm about, I will explain what the H index is, but you can find all of these numbers based on the SciVal data. So again, I mentioned that being important because the data in here in SciVal is based on the data in Scopus. And if you're missing publications out of your Scopus profile, or they're not counted because they're not indexed by Scopus, the data will not be complete for you. Um, to go a bit more, I'm just looking at those from Scopus. Yep, yep, I've explained that. Alrighty, any questions so far from that? Just making sure I don't miss anything. Okay. So then moving along to Web of Science. So Web of Science is another, um, you can have other data that you can draw from Web of Science. So this here is an example of journal information that you can pull from Web of Science. It's the journal impact factor. And so you can see here the journal impact factor of this particular journal is 3.336. Now, these will all be numbers, but you might, you will need to know where this is and how to look it up so that you can talk about, so say you're in the, um, you're in the position that you've been asked to submit a report to gain some research funding and you need to prove the, um, the quality of the journals that you've published in before. Now you've already looked up the SJR and you can see their Q status and you've got that down there. So you've got, you found the, of the 10 journals that you've published in, um, nine of them are Q1, 
perfect. Then you can also add in the journal impact factor that you can find here on Web of Science and you can add in that data as well. So that's a use case for when you'd want to add in that data. Okay, so, and this is more about um, research impact. So talking about the SJR, if it's Q1 or not. So you can see that from, that's a screenshot that was taken from SJR, where you can find the Q1 status on the, about the journal. The QR code here links to Symago. So again, I said you can find that by just simply Googling Symago. So the Symago journal rank or SJR is similar to the Eigen factor. The SJR gives greater weightage to citations from influential journals. It is based on the average number of weighted citations in a year to that published in the last three years. It uses information from Scopus to produce country and journal specific in indicators. SJR is published in Symago and Journal Country Rank Reports. So it also provides this nice visual that you can see there, the Q status. So it makes it a quick and easy reference if you're looking for journals that fit within the OASIC scheme. Okay. Now, Fahin mentioned before about the Altmetrics bookmarklet. So you saw Fahin give a demonstration of the Altmetrics bookmarklet. And I found an article just before that had even more. So I'm going to open that up in a second. But um, you can download the Altmetric it bookmarklet, which is free, and that will then give you the Altmetric information for any any article as you're looking for it. So it's really handy to know and really handy to use. So I will share my screen with you again and I'll show you. What sort of research output should you aim at producing each year? Alex, that's a really good question to posit to a supervisor. Um, it, differs depending on what sort of stage you're, um, you're at with your research career. Um, so you've recently committed a systematic re review for publication. Are you thinking of going on to a research career, Alex? While you're, go yes. while you're thinking about, I'm yeah, sorry, yep. Yes, I would. But I may not be working as an academic. I might sort of work for something like CSIRO or something like that, or DFAT or in research. Yeah. Uh, for, yep. So when uh, you say what sort, no. sorry, yeah. Yeah, I, I'd like, I think possibly um, working at DFAT, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and research, yep. the researcher there, yeah. Okay, well, if that was the case, I'd be looking at what the, the researchers who work there are producing and not to be worried about producing a certain number of research but rather looking at your quality and definitely within the fields that the um that dfat are researching and publishing in so if you were worried about a specific number for example or if you wanted to check the veracity of a type of research that you were doing that's when i would make contact with DFAT or with the department that you're wanting to publish in and asking that question of them directly. Also, I think a lot of their research is internal. Like they they don't actually re, uh, publish in journals. They just, yep. their, their research is, is basically classified. Yeah, so yeah. That's going to have some sort of an effect on your, your um, ORCID rankings, isn't it? Because you're not going to be able to do that. It, it will have an impact on the findability of your research. And definitely that sounds like more of a, an interview question that you could ask them, you know, at the end of an interview where they ask you if you have any questions, that would be the kind of perfect question to ask there. Okay, so I'm going to okay. share my screen with you. Sorry, did you so, have anything else? So normally, um, say you've been working for five or ten years in research, um, how, what would be expected of um, a researcher to publish every year? I mean, 
I know lecturers are extremely, you know, academics are extremely busy. How do they manage to do the research? Obviously, they become quicker, better at it and quicker at it, more efficient. Um, can, because, it's, I mean, we're doing, a, we do a PhD to start with and we do pro probably one or, you know, three, three at the most publications in, yep. four, in four years. But, um after that what should we what what would we expect in say of after about four or five years what would it depends expect? on where you where you where you move to um academic wise um i mentioned before that some disciplines um the research output is very um it, it's counted differently so um say if you're working in a a humanities area, for example, um, numbers aren't so important. It's more about the quality um, of the, the the kind of research that you're doing. Not to say that numbers don't mean quality. What I mean is the research outputs are different themselves. Um, so if you're moving into a more science, maths, um, psychology, that kind of like area or medicine, um, that's where the number of publications and more importantly the quality of the publication matters so when it comes down it's really hard to give you an answer when it comes to how many papers you will be guided if you like by your supervisory team when you move into an academic position and sometimes the numbers of papers will be built into your work contract and I can't speak to that because I'm not an academic myself. We work with academics. I hear anecdotally about the um, research that people are doing. We don't hear numbers though. Does that make sense, Alex? Yeah, I guess it, I, I guess there's a lot of um, factors in, involved that uh, you know, can affect how what your research output is going to be. So. It just depends on on what you know what what you choose to do with your career, and yes, um, and uh, yeah, it, it's more if you want to be um, an academic, you probably end up they probably be wanting you to do more research. Whereas if yeah. you're working for say DFAT or a public sector department, they'd expect uh, for you to research in the areas that they they want to. Um, have information on you know yeah so it could be one one thing that lasts for five years or for, or for a lifetime <laughs> even yeah yeah okay um yeah no thank you for your questions I've, i'll just keep moving on because we have limited time today but yeah please feel free pop any questions you have in the chat or feel free to ask as we go along to great questions thank you alex Okay, so the screen that I'm on now um, shows an article. I just wanted to show you again how the Altmetrics bookmarklet can help you find information. So you can see at the top of my screen here, I have Altmetric It. I'm going to click on that for this article that I found earlier. Here's one I prepared earlier. Hopefully it works. Worked for me before. Okay, I'm going to scroll back and we'll go again. Okay, so again, this is just an article that I found on Google. Okay, click on Altmetric It. And there we go. So we can see that this article has 790, it has a score of 793, which means it's had all of these different interactions. So it was picked up by 92 news outlets. And they're the, um, the red part of the donut here. It was blogged by five people, and that's the yellow part of the donut. It was referenced in one policy source. So this is where you can start to use this kind of information to show the, poten the impact of your research. So especially if you see something like it was referenced in a policy source, 
it was picked up in a night news outlet, it was blogged by people, it was um, referenced in Wikipedia pages, it's on a video. So if you, if this is your piece of research, I would be looking through all of these different mentions if I was you, to see how it's been used and then to include that when you're writing about your research and impact that it's having. So say you are needing to write an, a statement about the impact of your research, this is how you do it. So you use this information that you can find on Altmetric Bookmarklet. Okay, so moving right along. So here, if we go PowerPoint presentation. Right, so next we've got um, Plum X via Scopus. This is another research metric that you can use. I'm just trying to that away. Full screen mode. Cool. All right, so Plum X via Scopus. So Plum X has a nice little, um, much like the altmetric um, diagram, you have this little Plum X. Um, if you like diagram and this shows you again the different kinds of interactions that your article has had so a nice little these are alternative metrics so they're not metrics that are captured anywhere else they're metrics that are still important because they show that they're outside of if you like the academia they're showing the external reach of your research so you can see here from this particular um, article which you can access, this is in Scopus, you access this by going to view all metrics down the bottom here, that will then show you the Plum X diagram, which you can then click on to see all of the different information about that metric. So you can see that this metric has been shown, it's been cited 350 times, it's been tweeted about 143 times, it's been shared over 400 times, three times has been mentioned in policy. So again, that's a big one that you can talk about with your research. You can talk about how your research is having real world impact because it's been used in policy documents. Things like that, that's where these are very, very powerful metrics for you to use. Okay, now the H-index, as promised, let's explain and demystify the H-index for you. So what is the H-index? A H-index is just a numerical indicator that's based on the number of citations per each publication. It's the number of papers that have been cited at least that many times. So what that means is, you to have a H-index of 10, you would have 10 papers that have been cited at least 10 times. The larger the H-index is, it means you have a range of papers with that many citations, rather than one or two papers that have very high citations. So if you like, it's bringing your papers more into average. Uh, people get very hung up on it, but it's, it's not, the, it's not that useful if you're a new researcher and it can be misleading for older researchers as well. So you can find your H-index on Scopus, on Web of Science and Google Scholar. But again, with Google Scholar data, I would be very, very careful to make sure that the data that Google Scholar is showing is actually yours. So you, with any of your research identifiers, it's important that you make sure the data that they have in there is true and correct for you. Okay, um, there are problems with the H-index, however. The H-index is open to manipulation, okay? Um, you can skew it to be how you, how you want it to show. So for those of you here, you can retrieve your H-index from Web of Science, from Scopus, and from Google Scholar. You can use Housing's Publish or Perish to help you mine and, and improve your data on, on Google Scholar. Be aware, however, that the metric is only as good as the data that informs it. So you need to check, weed and clean the data in your um, whichever program you're using. So I mentioned there Google Scholar. Um, so follow good identity and hygiene practices when it comes to your research. 
The H-index is used to evaluate research in a field and it's also a common part of job applications for academic promote positions. But these numbers, much like any of the metrics we've talked about today, don't tell you, don't tell anything about the quality of your research they, on their own. They are used as metrics that you can then use to, um, that you can use to colour your research. So the two tools um, that can be used when calculating your H-index are Scopus or Web of Science. You can use Google Scholar, but be careful that your Google Scholar data is correct. So um, there's a QR code there on the screen as well that links through to the limitations of bibliometrics, an article that you might like to read. So as with any, the limitations there about the H-index, I would Add with that a caveat. So any time you write about any of your research metrics, um, include your why. Include why you've included them and include information that is supplementary to the numbers as well. So it's got there, if you write about your H-index, include how you calculated it and add there, include other things that show the other research and impact, the, the impact of your research. Okay, so Fahin mentioned before the read and publish agreements that CDU have signed. We've got them with CSIRO, Wiley, OUP, Springer and Wiley. I've mentioned Wiley there twice. <laughs> okay, um, the OASIC, the Open Access Support for Increased Citation Scheme is also important to know. And you, you also have the ability to place a pre or a post print of your research into CDU research into PURE. Why is that important? That's important because if you care about the accessibility of your research, you should be adding previous versions of your research into the institutional repository. That can make them free, even if free and open for anyone to read, even if your published um, work isn't, because universities can host copies of the, those versions of your research on the repository and make them available for anyone to read. So there's a link there at the bottom of the page too about the read and publish agreements. If you haven't checked them out, they're super important, but open access is, um, is a particular love of mine. So this is why this screen is here and especially to encourage you to um, add a pre or a post print of your research into the repository as well. If you have any questions about that, feel free to come and see me, send us an email. I'm more than happy to have a chat with you about that as well. Okay, and much like publishers, and Fahin already covered this, beware of predatory publishers who charge you to publish and then lock your research away. Um, anyone who has a unreliable, unclear peer review process, that likely means they don't have one. So beware of that. If anyone re re reaches out to you and asks you to publish with them, especially if they're being overly flattering, be wary of that. Um, check using any tools that you can, so things like Beals List, or it's Web and SJR, check the quality of someone who's come reaching out to you and potential publishers before you publish with them. And then use the Think, Check, Submit tool as well that um, you can use to make sure that you're publishing with a reputable publisher. And we're getting close to the end now and thinking about writing and about writing about your research. So here's how you can use the numbers. So, and the way that your numbers can be used to be impactful. So it's super important, especially for early career researchers to contextualize your research. Create a narrative that tells the story that, about you as a researcher and your research. A coherent story will convey the reach of your research better than the numbers alone. So what do you notice about this particular narrative? And it's probably pointed out best if you read the bottom narrative first. So if you're reading a narrative and all they want to talk about is their H-index, massive red flag. The top narrative or description of a person's research doesn't mention the H-index overtly. 
the H index is mentioned in the last sentence and you know that because you know when a researcher has a certain number of papers that have been cited a certain number of times, their H index is that number. So the H index for Dr. ABC is five, but he hasn't had to say that because he's been talking about the impact of his research. So publishing in peer reviewed re journals, um, the fact that he's published in, I'm trying to think, you can see that there. It's, it's called impactful writing about your research. Okay, so some final points. Do metrics matter? matter? So yes, they do to you as a researcher. They matter, but they're not the be all and end all. Using alt metrics and finding other ways that your research is used is useful, is important too. It's important to remember that the numbers, numbers on their own can be manipulated. So remember to place your research into context to prove relevancy and to show that your research matters. Remember too that you can't accurately compare yourself to another researcher in an unrelated discipline or at a different stage of their career. It isn't fair and it places more stress on you. So focus instead on your publishing journey and publishing well. Be aware that different sources of bibliometrics gather and update information at different times and stages. So what I mean by that is your scopus um, indexing might happen out of turn with something that you've, you've published so you do need to check them regularly so to keep make sure that your profiles are up to date and correct. Um, if you're in the arts and humanities your work can't be measured in the same way as scientific fields therefore your measure of quality will be different and to get an idea of what matters you're best talking amongst your peers with your supervisor and looking what's happening out in your field. Be aware of predatory publishers, publishing for the sake of publishing and choose collaborators carefully. Think about what you want to achieve, read any agreements carefully before you sign and seek legal advice or the advice of a professional academic librarian if you are in any doubt. Social media is fabulous for anyone at any stage of your um, research journey and it will increase your scope, reach and will increase your citations even from people who are disagreeing with you. So get your name out there legitimately. Use internal news channels such as CDU News, Yama or college meetings. Look for opportunities to present at conferences. Network. Write a piece for your professional body volunteer associations in your field of impact or influence, write for the conversation. Use social media like an influencer because you are. Tweet, share on LinkedIn and send it out on Facebook. Use email other interested colleagues at other institutions and look for other in influential experts in your field of interest, research and study and reach out to request to collaborate. You never know where that might get you. Any person, future supervisors, possible co-collaborators and future employers can and will look up your metrics. So you need to value add and place the metrics into context and you get to tell this story about you and your work. So um, I highly recommend looking up that URL for the Choose Your Own Adventure Academic Publishing Guide that was published by a previous colleague of mine at a university down south and it is amazing and will take you through your research journey. Okay. So if you're in doubt at all by anything that we've talked about today or in the future, just ask, reach out. So reach out to the Office of Research and Innovation here at CDU. Research to more senior established staff in your college. Reach out to your supervisor, to colleagues, and lastly, but by no means least, librarians. We're here to help you. So here's a page of further reading. Okay. How can an early career researcher make their research sound impressive? That's a great question, Alex, and one that I would highly encourage you to use alt metrics. So use the alt metrics to look for the impact of your research. You can um, note any um, verbal feedback that you've gotten and you can put that in any applications that you are making. 
um, certainly keep an eye on the altmetrics, make sure, look up the information about the journal where you've published as well, make sure that you mention their SJR, um, make sure that you mention any numbers they've got. Um, if you need some help with finding those out as well or um, anything more in depth, you can also reach out to us here in the library. Um, I'd also be talking to your supervisor as well. So to get their opinion on how you can make the, your, your first couple of publications really shine. Okay, and yeah, thanks Bernie. Okay, so this is now the last um, slide. So I'll point you in the direction of the QR code on the page. So you can scan that QR code, it will take you through to the librarians page where you can find information about how to contact us. You can also see um, our email address at the top, ask the library at cdu.edu.au. That will take you through to the librarian team. Research outputs at cdu.edu.au research.outputs, I should say, is the email address for the Office of Research and Innovation and specifically for any queries you have about the OASIC. Um, you can also see that I've included my references there. Um, and I think that's it for now. So are there, there's five minutes still, four minutes to go. Does anyone have any questions or comments? I'll just stop the recording, but I will stay around for the next four minutes or so if anyone has any questions. Oops.